We begin, I want to uh, point out that we have one bill proposed for our consent calendar, and that would be item number five, Senator Padilla's SB 1447. And I see we have our first author here. Thank you, Senator Yee. You are item number two, SB 840. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, members. Uh, let me present uh, to you uh, this uh, particular bill. Uh, but before I begin, uh, let me say that uh, I am prepared to um, uh, take amendments to create a wobblet that this would provide a dis the discretion to the prosecutor in charge uh, someone with a misdemeanor or an infraction. This bill is about protecting our children. Uh, we had a horrible situation uh, in Northern California where um, a, um, um, a young uh, lady was uh, raped. And uh, it was a rather horrible situation, as you can imagine. As a father, as someone who, who um, looks at a lot of these issues and start scratching his head as why why in the world these things happen but nevertheless it happens and then there were there were there, there, there were legions of individuals who saw what happened and nobody reported nobody did anything uh, until um, you know we later found out that uh, someone did report but nevertheless there were just legions of individuals who just did not bother to help this poor young lady. And so currently we have a uh, the, currently we have a law that basically says that if you're you know under 14 you, know, you have to report, but above that uh, you don't. And so what we're doing is to just simply merely extending that uh, law to say instead of 14 let's do it 18, and that's all this bill do. Let me uh, just say that uh, this is something that has gripped a lot of individuals, their heart and soul. And uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to move this bill along. So with that, urge and I vote. Thank you, Senator. Yeah, and I believe also uh, the bill proposes to extend some of the other sex crimes that would also be impacted by this requirement to report. That's, that's correct. Very good. So witnesses in support, welcome, District Attorney Harris. It's always great to see you before our committee. Good morning, Senator. Um, I am here in support of this bill uh, as a, a career prosecutor and someone who has specialized for a while in child sexual assault cases. Uh, one uh, reality of these kinds of crimes is that the, the, the devastation, the injury to the child who is the victim is lifelong, potentially. And um, because of then the seriousness of the nature of the offense and the outrageousness of these of the conduct that is involved with these kinds of crimes, we believe that it is absolutely the right thing to do to extend the protections that currently exist for children under the age of 14 to those children who are 15, 16, and 17. And that's what this law would do. Uh, it would also allow, of course, the district attorney in whatever jurisdiction upon reviewing the facts and, and the evidence to make a determination of whether or not the charge would be applicable and appropriate for the particular case that may be at hand. So this does not in any way uh, restrict or remove discretion from the prosecutor to make a charging decision, uh, but we do want prosecutors to be able to have the tools that are necessary to encourage good and appropriate behaviors, especially when we're talking about the protection of our children. This law would do that, and for that reason, I stand here in support. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Others in support. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Lieutenant Barbara Ferguson, San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department. I just want to say that if your 15, 16, or 17-year-old daughter was a victim of one of these crimes, you would want this law to be in place. And I urge your support. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Randall Hager representing the California Psychiatric Association. Um, I think it's very evident to my members, the psychiatrists that employ me, that um, that for a person to heal, the, uh, uh, and, and if they're the victim of a, of a sort of, uh, you know, a, one of the more serious crimes, um, that person's healing really doesn't start until a, a perpetrator can be brought to justice. And so on that psychological dimension, I think it's really important that we encourage people to step forward to make those identifications so that people can uh, begin that process of healing. For a young person, it's going to be particularly difficult, and so anything we can do to encourage that I think is a good thing. We're in support. Thank you, Mr. Hager. Others in support? Hi, my name is Rhonda James, and I'm the Executive Director for Community Violence Solutions. We're the sexual assault services agency that serves in Richmond. We serve in Contra Costa and Marin County. We were the folks who actually 
uh, show up 24-7, and we're very much involved in the, the case in point. Um, and I'm here to talk more, not only from the victim's point of view, which really does suggest that uh, our childhood doesn't end at 14, and it's really appropriate that we continue to expand the Children's Protection Act, but I'm here more to speak about so many offenders that we end up working with are, are almost offenders in our male program, and really what, what young men are looking for is one person to say no. It really doesn't take a village to, to change the tide of a sexual assault in, in process, and over and over the young men we work with tell us they're looking for one person to say no or to call 911 and step away, and that that actually changes the entire uh, process of, of, a, of an in-process assault, not to mention later behavior. So I'm, I'm here on that on behalf of uh, this particular Senate bill. Thank you. Thank that's you. valuable testimony to hear. Mr. Chairman, members, Randy Perry with Aaron Reed and Associates on behalf of PORAC in full support of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Ralph Ochoa. And I'm on the uh, National Board of Child Health, and uh, that's an organization that uh, for 50 years has been dedicated to the prevention and treatment of child abuse. And um, we have a number of programs, uh, including foster homes, group homes, and uh, we have a residential home in Beaumont and Tennessee and Virginia. And uh, in working with law enforcement, we have found that it is uh, oftentimes in different communities difficult to uh, have an incentive for persons to come up, and we're convinced that uh, this bill will help. Mr. Ochoa, I hate to cut you off mid-sentence, but we're going to establish our quorum as one of our members has to get to another committee. So if you could please call the roll. Leno? Here. Hogdale? Here. Cedillo? Hancock? Here. Huff? Here. Steinberg? Wright? Thanks, Dave. Our quorum is established. Mr. Ochoa, please proceed. <laughs> I, I urge uh, and I vote on uh, SB 840. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is John Loftus. I'm the commander in charge of investigations with the San Francisco Police Department. I'm here today representing the San Francisco Police Department and Chief George Gascon. I'm here to urge the members of the legislature to support Senate Bill 840. Um, actually, I think it's kind of unfortunate and somewhat distressing that we have to come here and meet today to discuss adopting legislation uh, to hold people accountable for what they should be doing anyway. It's a civic responsibility. It's their obligation. And we wholeheartedly um, support this bill. And we ask you that you support it also so that we can um, use it as a tool to encourage the public to do what they're supposed to do. Thank you, Mr. Loftus. Thank you very much. Anybody else here to speak in support of Senator Yee's SB 840? If not, we'll ask the opposition to please step forward. Okay. <laughs> You'd like to go first. I'll go first. Good morning, Mr. <clears throat> Chair, uh, members of the committee. Uh, I find myself, uh, Marty Veranicar on behalf of the California District Attorneys Association, I find myself in a rather unenviable position uh, to uh, testify in opposition to a bill that's supported by one of our member elected district attorneys. Uh, however, um, CDAA opposed uh, this legislation, which uh, initially created the bill back in 2000, we did not feel that that the measure would encourage uh, individuals to report these serious crimes. And this crime then basically expands uh, both the individuals who are covered by it, uh, provides an, a, a particular exception for the victim, which was not in the original statute, plus adds uh, a new uh, sex crimes uh, to the list. And our opposition is based on the following. Our position of opposition to the previous legislation, we felt it was unnecessary then, it's unnecessary now. I think that the, the biggest issue is that there's a broad exception in the current law that exempts individuals from reporting if uh, they fear for their safety or the safety of uh, uh, their family. Uh, I think that the exception, in essence, swallows the rule, especially in a lot of gang-impacted communities. 
uh, the witness is going to say, I was afraid for my safety, that's why I didn't report. The other issue that prosecutors have, as opposed to uh, uh, what law enforcement might have, is that uh, in the event uh, we do locate a witness who did not support, I mean who did not report the crime, then in order to be able to use that witness in our case, we would have to immunize that individual and as a result, uh, that has some impact on our cases because that individual can be impeached as a result of whatever bargain was reached. I think the policy goal uh, should be to encourage uh, witnesses to report crimes. I think law enforcement said it right when they said this is, this is and should be continue to be a public, uh, um, just public service to, to report crimes. I don't think this bill uh, furthers that goal, uh, but discourages reporting, and it does nothing to counter what we have out there in many communities, the do not snitch culture. Uh, for those reasons, we urge a uh, no vote on this measure. Mr. Veradikar, the uh, California District Attorneys Association is clearly being consistent in its position, uh, which I always appreciate. But I do want to ask, can the current law inform us at all as to whether your concerns were actually realized? I, I do not believe that uh, we have uh, very, very many instances that we could point to in which that current law w was useful one way or the other. And um, it, it, it's one of those things, perhaps law enforcement has, has a better picture uh, on whether or not they were able to use that that tool as perhaps an incentive to someone that they suspected was a witness and they were able to to deal with that person on that end but as far as the prosecution is concerned uh, I, I don't believe we've had uh, instances where that law has helped or uh, 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 in in whatever fashion to encourage witnesses to uh, come forward but from the prosecutor's perspective we don't know if any witnesses have been been discouraged or even spoiled as a result. I can't point to uh, I can't point to a particular case for that. Okay. No. Very good. And it's always uh, of interest when we have the District Attorneys Association, this, the this must, ACLU, at the same table. It must be a historic. <laughs> must be a historic <laughs> day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we see it now and again. It's Every once in a while, we do. <laughs> Val, uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Valerie Small Navarro, with the American Civil Liberties Union, also in opposition, um, with great regret. Um, I would like to point out, I think we all can, all everyone in this room can agree that the goal of getting people to report crimes, whether it's these crimes or any other crimes, is important. I think, unfortunately, however, this bill goes about it th in the wrong way. And I think what's important to note is that if, if people in communities felt that they could trust law enforcement, if they felt that uh, that they would be protected when they made reports of certain crimes, I think we might actually f f see a tremendous difference in the reporting of crimes. And I think, um, I think when this, a similar bill was brought up in uh, Assembly Public Safety Committee, we saw Ms. Skinner kind of making those points, I think. And so I would suggest to you that that while we agree with the goal, we don't agree with the approach. The other thing is, quite frankly, it makes it um, wrong, you know, if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, you have committed a crime if you fail to report. And I think, I don't think we want to do that in our society or continue to, to enlarge in that, that premise. So I would suggest to you that wrong place, wrong time, failure to report is not really a crime as we traditionally know crimes. Crimes usually have a bad intent and bad actions and, and quite, quite honestly that doesn't happen here. Um, finally, I'd like to make a point that there are communities among our communities that are particularly sensitive um, and nervous about talking to law enforcement. And I think with a good reason. There are people from immigrant communities who have come from places where law enforcement was not their friends. I think people uh, 
perhaps homeless people, perhaps other folks with mental disabilities. I think there are a number of people who, who have very good reasons not to go to law enforcement. So again, while I appreciate the author's efforts, I sincerely believe that this is not the way to go about it, and I think we could do better. So I encourage a no vote on this bill. Ms. Maldivaro, I've got a question for you as well. Clearly, the challenge with the legislation and before the committee is how do we legislate morality because this really is a, a moral responsibility right. that you see evil being perpetrated you see another human being harmed right. in this fashion how do we instill in that individual a legal requirement to do what is right okay. so that's the, what i think the argument is before us so is there a way to amend the bill so that we could those who are wrong place, wrong time, and those who are actually focused on it and somehow mesmerized by the horror before their eyes and not doing what they should? Because it seems like different situations. Uh, well, the, it could be possible to redraft that with your brilliant staff. <laughs> but that is where not, the brilliance lies <laughs> in the committee. We know that. But I'm not sure about how to do it right this second, because sure. quite honestly, I think what we're talking about is fundamental issues with law enforcement and communities and trust and willingness to make these reports. And when things get really blown out of proportion, as they did in this particular situation, um, that's something very severe that has to look, be looked at carefully, but that's not the general sure. situation. And I would imagine so, that the amendment allowing for the discretion of the prosecutor to charge either infraction or misdemeanor gives you some comfort. It does give me some comfort. Right. Okay. <laughs> On a scale. Uh, others in opposition. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members. Ignacio Hernandez on behalf of the California Attorneys for Criminal Justice. And we're kind of in between on this one, and, and let me explain. So we're either going to be on opposite sides of ACLU or on the same side as the uh, CDAA. So I'm looking, for, I'm looking forward to you know, either one of those. Uh, where we're at is really, I think, what, uh, what the chair just uh, stated a, a minute or two ago, trying to find out, figure out a way if they're to improve the current statute in a way that's balanced and fair for everyone. And because the Senate uh, reached out, the author reached out very early on in the process uh, before he introduced the bill. We have been in discussions with his office to try to figure that out if we can get there. I don't know that we can, but we on, on our side, or the defense attorney side, are, are making an effort. Our challenge is that we dislike the uh, the current statute. We opposed it when it was uh, came up. Um, I was working in the building when it came up. I remember the incident quite well and the media coverage. And concern for us is, is, is Couple, couple issues. One is this does not require that somebody actually watch a crime. It's that they think they are seeing a crime. And that's one of the problems for us, that you can be, technically you can be convicted under the statute if you believe a crime was committed because of the age of, uh, maybe the age of two people having uh, sexual intercourse. But it, it not necessarily be a crime. It turns out that maybe the person was over 18 or, you know, different ages, so no crime was committed, but technically you violated the law. And that for us is just a fundamental challenge for us uh, with the current statute. Uh, and so the issue of uh, what happened in Richmond and there was an incident that should have been reported, we certainly sympathize and, and, and understand that, you know, we do need to do something to help in those situations. Uh, so we're trying desperately to figure out if there is a way we can come to a common ground that makes sense um, uh, for the reporting and at the same time protect individuals so that it doesn't become uh, a tool for, you know, perhaps some rogue law enforcement to round up everyone in a neighborhood and say, well, you must have seen something, and so we're going to round up everybody until they answer. So we have to deal with the current situation, the current case, but also the outlying incidents. I don't know that we'll get there, but I want to thank the author for, for attempting. The other issue that we have uh, is that the exceptions that are in current law we think don't go far enough, and so we are uh, working to draft suggested changes that perhaps the author would, would you know, consider. And so if the bill goes forward, we will continue to do that, but we do reserve the right to either support or oppose and join our colleagues or oppose our friends or somehow, I don't know, but it's kumbaya with somebody, so we'll see. Mr. But Hernandez, let me that. ask you the same question that I asked the district attorneys. Yes. Given that you had opposed the original bill, has the time since it was enacted in 2000 informed us at all as to whether your fears have come to be? The have we seen the otherwise in innocent people 
the infor right into this net? The informal survey that we've had of our members, uh, I've probably talked to, you know, 40 or 50 of our members up and down the state. We have not, they have not had any clients prosecuted under this. It's generally there are other statutes that come into play where they could have been charged with this misdemeanor, but they, you know, perhaps uh, generally we find uh, like aiding and abetting, you know, those types of, of statutes are, are being used to arrest folks. This is kind of something that's, that's not charged, but it's kind of laying there as a possibility but they just hadn't been charged with it. So no, we haven't seen a huge um, a use of the current statute. Uh, but nonetheless, even one person who uh, is what we think is unfairly uh, prosecuted under the statute would be enough for us to be concerned. So, uh, but thus far, we have not. But, but in, in light of the Richmond case, I, we could see an entire neighborhood or, you know, dozens and dozens, dozens of high school kids arrested for this, um, whether they saw it or not. Or the, the other thing in Richmond, I think it was maybe about a couple of weeks after that incident, there was someone who claimed uh, a similar incident of, of, a, of a gang rape. Uh, and again, it was in a neighborhood daylight, and again, we could see people rounded up for that under the statute. It turned out that the, the alleged victim recanted later and said that, you know, she had made it up. Um, and so that's where we get concerned, especially on the the the, uh, the way that the statute is drafted. If you reasonably th believe that somebody has committed a crime, you, can, you should report, otherwise you're convicted. So in that situation, somebody lied about an incident, but someone who didn't report it could still be prosecuted, and that's where we just fundamentally have a problem with it, whether or not anyone's been prosecuted under it. And again, just to – all your arguments are, are well taken. Uh, at the same time, we'd have to believe that for otherwise innocent people to be harmed by this bill, that you'd have to have an aggressive police department that actually – feels that this is worth their time and energy to actually arrest, and then uh, simultaneously a district attorney who feels that this is something that they want to pursue as well. So I think... I understand. Leaning in favor of the bill, minimally, it suggests to the populace that you have not only a moral responsibility, but potentially a legal liability if you don't do the right thing, and I think there could be value in that alone. Well, anyone else who would like to testify in opposition to Senator Yee's bill? Mr. Chair, if yes. I, I can beg your indulgence. Um, go right we did, ahead. We, we did have some supporters uh, who got stuck in traffic sure. from Richmond. If you could um, uh, allow them to speak in support, I would appreciate that. Sure. Uh, since we've already had uh, more than a handful of people speaking in support and a few in opposition, if you are here in support and you'd like to give your name, and affiliation, please do so. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Reverend Andre Shoemake, president of the Richmond Improvement Association, a coalition of 80 congregations from the city of Richmond. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate your coming to Sacramento. Thank you for this opportunity, and forgive me, I'm short of breath. Uh, we just arrived in Sacramento, and you know how wonderful it is to find a park in and around yes. the Capitol. <laughs> and we had to sprint to get here. So I, I'm here today uh, in support of, of this, uh, this bill. Uh, my concern about the existing statute was whether or not there had been uh, any harassment of innocent people as a result of the current statute. Uh, and what I discovered is that in the city of Richmond, um, there hasn't been any unnecessary arrest or harassment as it relates to the current statute. Uh, last year in the city of Richmond, we had a 68 percent increase in homicides. 17 percent of those homicides was youth under the age of 18. Our concern is that if we don't have this tool available to us to protect our youth, then we're not going to be able to get to the bottom of this problem in the city of Richmond. Uh, we ask that you support this legislation. Uh, we know you can't legislate morality, but I believe by this statute being in place, with the age being increased to 18, it will get residents of our city to the point where they know that they can be held responsible. We need this tool uh, to help us in our efforts to combat the violence that's occurring in the city of Richmond. I was one of the responders to the young 16-year-old girl, uh, four, yeah, 16, that was raped in the city of Richmond. Horrendous case. And I just believe that had this law been in effect with the age up to 18, that someone would have been compelled 
just by the very, very fact of knowing that they could be held liable for not coming forth, I believe someone would have come forth. And so we ask you, as challenging as it may be, um, to help us and to give us this tool, because without it, uh, we're going to continue to see this madness happen on the streets of the, of the city. And believe me, I am concerned about the rights of the citizens. I am concerned uh, as to whether or not the police uh, will use it and, and abuse it. And I'm delighted to say that in the city of Richmond, with the, uh, the department chief that we have right now, uh, we haven't had any experiences like that. And I believe that uh, the professionals, uh, men and women in blue in our city, will do the appropriate thing and utilize it uh, within the statute and not go beyond that. So I say to you, please, sir, please, ma'am, uh, help us and, and move this forward because we need this as an additional tool to address the issue of violence in Richmond. Thank you very much for your testimony, sir. Uh, my name is James Cash. I'm part of the Richmond Improvement Association. I'm a realist. I really believe, you know, that this law needs to be done because we can sit around until somebody come up with something different, and it's going to be 25 years from now. we got to teach the kids the right because their parents are not showing them they need to report stuff. You can have stuff happen now, and everybody will just drive by and don't say nothing. And you'll never get any evidence for nothing because you don't have no witnesses. People nowadays need to come forward and come out and say they got all the kind of programs that the, the police can use to try to get the guy to come forward. But if the, this tool right here, the police can use their own discretion on how they need to arrest this person or not. But at least they can have that tool to use. Because right now, everybody's just turning their back. And, you know, it's a lot of people getting shot, and it's a lot of people standing there looking. And it's just not just rape. It's a whole lot of stuff going on. But we don't have a tool for that. Nothing's going to be done. Thank so you, I, I really hope you guys vote this in. If I could add real quick, and what's important with that right now, there are people who want to come forth, but they intimidated feeling that there would be repercussions of them coming forth. And so that's their justification for not doing it, and in many cases legitimate. Uh, this tool would say to them that... Now there is legislation in place where they have a legal obligation to come forth, whereas before, right now, although we know they have a moral responsibility, they now can say, well, legally, I've got to do this or I can be held accountable. So, again, it's that extra little motivation that we think can help us mm -hmm. to help them to do the right thing. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Appreciate your coming from Richmond today. Right. Committee members, questions, comments? Yes. Uh, Senator Cedillo and then Senator Hancock. I, I appreciate the um, range of questions that you asked. Essentially, can we instill morality by, by law? Can we instill duty? But it appears that's the very nature of law. Every single law is, is some effort for us to codify, to create a statute that says this is the moral conduct, this is the social contract that you have to engage in. So, you know, we do that every day. That's what every law is, is, is some effort for us to construct uh, a social contract in our society. So the answer, can we do that, is yes. We do it every day. Uh, in fact, the law represents the base of our morality. It's the minimum standard for which we agree that we will conduct our, ourselves. Uh, I appreciate the question, so the questions that you asked, whether or not the previous law had the adverse impacts people were concerned about. Because at the end of the day, we can speculate and we can you know, talk about the theory of it, but at the end, we have to look at what's the impact, what's the effect. I don't think it's going to solve all the problems that, uh, that the city of Richmond has or the state of California has. I do think it could create some problems. I appreciate the concerns raised by the ACLU around the question of immigrants uh, and homeless, but that's a separate problem, right? That's a separate question. Then the question of immigrants... Um, well, there's a lot of things we can do. You could take an amendment uh, in Los Angeles. They have a, something called Special Order 40. And you could amend Special Order 40 into your bill, and that says no one will have an adverse impact if they report a crime to the police. Uh, it's the basis for good police relations, police community relations in Los Angeles, and it's been in existence since uh, Police Chief Daryl Gates continued through Police Chief Willie Williams, through Police Chief Bernie Parks, Police Chief Bratton, Police Chief Becker. So you could put that in your bill, 
I recommend it. You can put that in your bill, and that would address the concerns anyone has about immigrants reporting uh, um, crimes that they, that they witness. Uh, on the question of homeless, I'm not quite sure specifically uh, what the problems are and the challenges that confront them uh, and to what extent we can motivate homeless people with all the challenges they have to have this, recognize this type of duty. Uh, because in many, in many instances, the life of the homeless community is a, it's a lawless life. Uh, but we should not accept that simply because that, that's the case. Um, I'm, I think I'm satisfied, Mr. Chair, that there is an abundance of discretion here um, and that the law enforcement community has to decide in their judgment when to exercise that, that discretion. And there's enough of cases where you know, the law enforcement community not satisfied with what the courts or what the legislature has said is lax on, on implementing uh, the law. Uh, and so, given given that, uh, I heard that the current statute is flawed, but no examples of what those problems were. I mean, I also share the concerns that were articulated, but I think it was thoughtful of you to ask, give me examples of where this has failed us. Um, and um, none were presented. And so given that, this may, uh, I'm inclined to vote for it. I am going to vote for it. This may be nothing more than chicken soup and prayer, uh, but they seldom hurt. Um, and so uh, I'm happy to support the bill uh, as it's been crafted. Well stated. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hancock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, share many of the thoughts of Senator Cedillo and also appreciated your questions very much. Um, the city of Richmond is in the 9th Senate District. And I will tell you that I have been to more community vigils and community meetings with increasingly desperate citizens looking for ways to send the right message, what to do about some of the total disconnect from human feeling in society that can get played out on the streets of many of our cities. Uh, I do. I will vote for this bill today. I think that it should move forward. I'm persuaded, really, by some of the community groups that spoke, because I know you're out there working with the young men as well as the young women, and that our young people are looking for signs of what the adult community really finds acceptable and unacceptable. And I believe that whatever we do to add our little weight at this point, um, in the direction of responsibility and compassion uh, we can do. I would urge the author um, and the, the committee to continue to work on the nuances that were raised here and to see if there is a way that someone who happens to be in the wrong place, wrong time, passing by, whatever, is different from someone engaged in um, some voyeuristic or whatever, op, you know, participation in what's happening. And um, I believe that with the good faith that's been shown today on all sides and an understanding of both sides on all sides, um, we can get there. But I do think the bill, um, as it stands now, is also worth supporting today, and I would move the bill. The bill has been moved by Senator Hancock. Would you like to close, Senator? Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And, uh, let me thank you and uh, your staff for uh, your assistance in this particular bill. I, I am very, very concerned about uh, the objections raised by the ACLU. I, I, I feel uh, that they do have some legitimate concerns, and those were concerns that I had when I first entered into this uh, particular arena. You know, I'm, I'm not known for as a senator that deals with uh, issues um, that uh, will turn something uh, 380 degrees or 180 degrees. You know, we, we tend to be very measured and we tend to be very, very balanced. This does not open the doors to everyone. It just simply says, let's extend it so that our children are protected. And that's all this bill will do. Uh, we also did take some amendments uh, that uh, would provide some safe havens. Uh, those individuals who uh, somehow mistaken uh, uh, or that there's reasonable mistakes of facts, 
those individuals who somehow fear uh, for their own safety. Uh, so so, so we, we, we've taken some of those. We will continue to talk to the opposition to uh, ensure that there are no unintended consequences. But fundamentally, this is an additional tool to help a community uh, that is in crisis. And, and you know, are we going to solve all their problems? No. But I think that it will be one additional tool that will help protect some of the kids there. My last point is that there is a provision in the Fish and Game Code in Section 12151.5. And it says that any person who, while hunting, kills or wounds or witnesses the killing or wounding of any human being or domestic animal needs to be, re they need to report. It was the Cheney Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> it may be. But, but yet for kids, um, we, we, you know, we don't have to report. I, I think there's something wrong. And so with that, um, again, you know, let me thank you, Mr. Chair, and your staff for this uh, help, and uh, we will continue to work with you on this particular matter. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Senator. I think we've had a healthy debate on this and looked at it from all sides. I would have much greater concern if we had heard from the district attorneys that, in fact, as a result of the passage of then uh, Assemblyman Torlakson's bill, let me get that straight, it was Assemblyman uh, uh, Torlakson's bill in 2000, that witnesses had to be disqualified, that it in interfered with the prosecution in the courtroom. That would be of great concern, I think, to everyone here on the committee, but it actually hasn't happened. We haven't seen abuse, as we've heard from your witnesses from Richmond. So I think that as you move forward, and I'm pleased that you've been working with California Attorneys for Criminal Justice and with the ACLU, uh, that there may be possibility, and it's not easy to do, uh, but we'll see if there is the possibility of uh, further amendments, as Senator Hancock has says, to nuance some of these finer issues. But I believe that with this bill as statute, that it will send a message to neighbors, to community members, that there is more than just a moral responsibility, that there is also a legal responsibility and liability, and that if it were abused, the community would speak its mind and let law enforcement know. And if it were underutilized and the situation with this 15-year-old girl were to be repeated and there was no legal response, that the police would hear about that as well. So sometimes uh, a little faith in the community and the process, I think, is valued. And as Senator Cidio said, uh, as with prayer and chicken soup, it can't hurt. So uh, we will call the roll. <clears throat> Leno? Aye. Leno, aye. Cogdale? Cedillo? Aye. Cedillo, aye. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Huff? Steinberg, right. You need one more vote. Uh, committee members will be returning from other committee hearings, so uh, we will move this out of committee, I would imagine, before we conclude our business today. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> We'll give the room just a moment to clear. Our next author is Senator Runner, who has our item number one, his SB 839. Welcome, Senator Runner. Good morning, Mr. Chair and uh, <laughs> appreciate being here and I uh, would like to present to you uh, Senate Bill uh, 839, the Blue Alert. Senate Bill 839, also known as Blue Alert, would authorize the CHP to use existing statewide Amber Alert notification system when a peace officer has been killed, seriously wounded, or assaulted with a deadly weapon and the suspect has fled the scene. Access to existing emergency notification system would allow law enforcement officials and broadcasters to quickly send out a blue alert with a license plate number or other vehicle and suspect descriptions to help authorities locate the perpetrator. While many crime categories declined in 2009, the murder of, of peace officers increased by more than 25%. Part of this disturbing trend was the killing of 15 officers in just five incidents.
Uh, four officers were killed in Oakland and six in Seattle last year. The Blue Alert Response System will use the EDIS, Emergency Digital Information Services System, local digital signs, focused cell phone text alerts, and many other technologies that have developed and may also employ the EAS, Emergency Alert System, after the federal government has established a blue code. This bill has strong support from law enforcement groups and is sponsored by the Sheriff's Association, the Broadcasters Association, PORAC, ALADS, and the Association of Highway Patrolmen. Their experts can answer any technical questions that you may have. I'd be glad to ask for your I vote. I didn't get rid of for some questions. I didn't know that we were doing that to you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Roy. Those in support. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Lieutenant Barbara Ferguson, San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department in support. I'm also here on behalf of the California State Sheriff's Association as a sponsor, a co-sponsor in support. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. Mr. Chairman, members, Randy Perry on behalf of the California Association High Patrolman and PORAC and co-sponsors of this. Uh, it, this measure isn't only to protect further uh, injury to officers or possibly death to officers when this person is still in flight. It's also, uh, we believe that a person who has gone as far as uh, injuring a peace officer or possibly killing a peace officer will stop at nothing, will injure any citizen that gets in their way and uh, basically at this point has nothing to lose. So it's really a warning to the public more than it is other peace officers. Good point. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Good morning. I'm Sergeant Bill Mulder with the Los Angeles County Sheriff Department, appearing on behalf of Sheriff Lee Baca, and we're in support of this bill and urge your I vote for this. Thank you, Sergeant. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members, Dan Filizotto on behalf of the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. For the reasons stated, our office is in support as well. Thank you, Mr. Filizotto. Mr. Chairman and members, Brian Lundgren on behalf of the Orange County Board of Supervisors in strong support. Thank you, Mr. Lundgren. I'm Mr. Chairman Mark Powers on behalf of the California Broadcasters Association. We support the bill. Thank you, Mr. Powers. David Warren, Taxpayers for Improving Public Safety. We support the bill. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Happy Passover. Anyone else in support in any opposition? I think one question that comes to mind, Senator, is how would this impact the Amber Alert right. system and then should Senator Alquist, silver alert also become law. At what point does the system risk any kind of overload? Very valid question. I know we've had some discussion with the committee on this issue, too. Um, as the author of Amber Alert, uh, it certainly was a concern for us. And our review, uh, we, we basically have been averaging about 20 Amber Alerts a year. Uh, since the inception in 2002. And uh, given the criteria that we see that we've set, and we certainly are ongoing t to try to help narrow that also if, we s if that's a concern, uh, we think that this would result in about half that number additional per year. So we see this as about a maximum of 10 given the parameters that we're dealing with. Uh, and uh, because that certainly is of a, of a great concern to us, uh, we think that this is much different than the silver alert in the sense that this is a very narrow issue. Um, and uh, believe me, we would be at the top of the list of concerns if we felt that this in any way undermined the success that we've had with the Amber Alert. Sure. The timing of your bill is of significance and that we just noted and commemorated the first anniversary of the murders of the officers in Oakland just mm -hmm. this past week. Yes. Any questions from the committee? Any committee to ask questions? Uh, we will take this up as soon as committee members are returning from other committee hearings. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your presentation, you. Senator. Oh, Senator Cedillo moves the bill. Okay. And we will call the roll. Leno? Aye. Leno, aye. Cogdill? Cedillo? Cedillo, aye. Cedillo, aye. Hancock? Huff? Steinberg? Wright? This is the blue alert for the assaulted police officers to be... Oh, under right under eye. Under. Right eye. You have three votes. You, you need four. We'll put it on call. Thank you. Senator Lewis here. Our next author is Senator Liu, who has her SB 962, our item number three. Welcome, Senator Liu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Committee members, um, I ask for your support on SB 962. This bill allows incarcerated parents to participate in uh, a child dependency hearing via video conference if the technology is available for any contested hearing or a proceeding that could result in termination of parental rights. A substantial majority of Californians in the criminal justice uh, system are parents 
As the a number of inmates rise, so do the number of children with incarcerated parents. These children often enter and remain in the child welfare system because logistical issues prevent par parental involvement in their dependency proceedings. Incarcerated parents often waive physical appearance at hearings not because they are unwilling to be present but, and participate, but because attending may result in the loss of good time credits or rehabilitation program eligibility. These are the very credits or program participation required by the family reunification case plan. And if a parent elects to att attend a dependency hearing in person, hearing and travel time can take up to 10 days, greatly damaging the parent's ability to fulfill the uh, family reunification requirements. This bill ensures a prisoner in custody will not lose rehabilitation opportunities due to participation in these proceedings unless the inmate is absent from the institution for longer than 10 days. In addition, a pilot project to facilitate dependency hearings uh, via video conferencing will be implemented by the Los Angeles Dependency Lawyers and a woman's prison. For years, researchers have cited transportation difficulties as a major barrier to, uh, to an to involvement in dependency hearings and have urged policymakers to fix this uh, problem. In the wake of fiscal distress, counties in other states have already begun utilizing video conferencing for inmates as cost-saving measures. And this bill will prom promote family reunification and decrease the number of children in our child welfare system. And I ask for your support on this bill. Thank you, Senator Lou. I think the bill also allows for teleconferencing as yes. well. Yes, absolutely, Very yes. Good. If the technology is available. If it's available, correct. Right. We really do put these parents in a double bind, a catch-22 of sorts, don't we? Right. And this is trying to unwind that. Right. So those in support. My name is Marlene Firth, and I'm a lawyer. I represent the Los Angeles Dependency Lawyers. We're also a co-sponsor of the bill. We represent approximately 16,000 parents in Los Angeles County whose children have come into the child welfare system and are before the dependency judges. Um, many of our uh, parents are incarcerated. The majority are nonviolent offenders. And it's critical that when children first come into the dependency system that parents have the opportunity to come before the judges so that the courts can see the relationship between the parents and the children. and. It's also important, obviously, for the judges to see the rehabilitative process that's going on. It's equally important that the children see their parents dialoguing with the judges and just their mere presence. It's critical to the children. Most parents want very much to attend all the hearings. However, without legislative action now, many are unable to continue with their rehabilitation programs because of their time away, precisely what you're talking about. And so it puts them in that kind of bind. What the bill encourages is parental participation without the loss of rehabilitation, and it enables parents to be present through video and telephonic conferencing. Um, I've represented both parents and children in the dependency court for over 20 years now, and I have to say that too many times I have observed parental rights unnecessarily being terminated and children severed from entire families. And when I think of those children and families, um, it's the basis for why we're here and why we're urging you to vote aye on the bill. Thank you, Ms. Firth. My name is Gretchen Newby, and I'm executive director of Friends Outside, and I'm the co-sponsor of this bill. Advocating on behalf of incarcerated parents and their children is a key construct of our mission, and it has been so for 55 years. By making incarcerated parents' participation in custody hearings possible, we are supporting family reunification, which has been demonstrated that when we keep families intact, we reduce recidivism. With regard to children, a parent's participation in hearing provides for the well-being that for hearings involving the well-being of their children, lets the child know that their parent cares, and their absence in the process sends the opposite message. If parental rights need to be terminated in the well-being of the child, then participation of the parent will help us to expedite this process in order to get the child into a safe and stable home environment. 
I ask you to help us to do the right thing in order to increase positive outcomes for families and children who need all the help they can get. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you, Ms. Newby. Others in support? Hi, I'm Wendy Kingston from the Los Angeles Dependency Lawyers Legislative Committee. We're in support of SB 962 and urge your support too. Thank you, Ms. Kingston. David Warren, Taxpayers for Improving Public Safety. As you know, I'm a volunteer chaplain at the Women's Facility at CIW, and it is a constant and remitting problem that inmates are not fully aware of the uh, consequence of the documents they receive, and this will assure that they can participate because uh, parental rights are often terminated without the inmate actually understanding what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Anyone else in support? Any opposition? Questions from the committee? Just Senator Wright. I wanted to, to be clear. On, there, there are two issues. One issue, as I understand, is the ability to have a teleconference for the termination of the right. The, the, the parental rights that you could do through teleconference. Yes. So that would, would that be at the option of the, the inmate or would it be mandated that it be done through teleconference? Um, at this time, under the penal code, there are specific hearings where parents have a right to be present. Mm -hmm. And so they're brought in. Right. Um, the issue is, one, I think the technology is there where we don't have to use buses coming in from all over the state with the pollution and with the cost when clients can be present through video and telephonic conferencing. What we would like to do and what the bill enables is more parental participation through video and telephonic conferencing, which is a plus plus for everybody. The courts order the presence. The court will allow for, if the technology is there, for the video and telephonic conferencing. In addition to that, our agency, along with friends from the outside, are going to create a pilot project in which we'll be able to create the data and really see exactly um, how, how the technology works. But in Los Angeles County, some of the other courts have already started this. So it's a very workable thing. And I know the Los Angeles sheriffs find it to be a, a good tool. In addition, yeah because some parents want to come to the hearings and it's critical that they be there. We just don't want them to be penalized by losing uh, the rehabilitative classes that they lose now by choosing to come to court. I mean, they really are put exactly in that bind where when they decide to be transported, they lose their position in the classes, they lose privileges, and there's an encouragement almost not to attend and then they disappear before the judges. The kids don't see them. The judges don't understand that they may be working on the very classes that they need to rehabilitate with their children. So what we want to do is encourage them by saying there should not be any loss of privileges or the loss of the rehabilitative classes so that they can successfully reunite with their families. Okay, that, that wasn't my question. <laughs> Who's whose option and at whose discretion the courts. did the teleconference done? The courts. So, if I, so if I'm a parent and I decide I want to go, the court could say you have to do the teleconference? No. Okay. No. Okay. That's, that was my question. So again, I mean, I understand the advantage of having the teleconference, but if I'm the parent and I want to go, this doesn't abrogate my right to attend in person. Under the statute, those hearings that are statutorily mandated, the parents can come. But it's a plus from, for them based on what I've just said. Gotcha. So the, right. so, the, so the option of attending remains with the parent, and the teleconferencing option is offered as a plus to that person. Yes. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Senator Wright. Any other questions? Um, Senator Cedillo? <laughs> I know that this is really convenient and technology has moved us in places we couldn't imagine since the days of Dick Tracy, the little phones on your wrists showing our age here. But uh, is anyone concerned or is it just me about a slippery slope and people's right, and I think it goes along with what uh, Senator Wright was raising, 
people's right to have an ability to appear in front of people, in front of judges, to confront witnesses, to do all the things that are part of the uh, judicial system. Um, and that this puts us on a slippery slope. And later on, we'll have teleconferencing for hearings and trials, and people will not be able to confront witnesses. And so uh, I'm, I trust you, uh, and I support your intent. But I just want to kind of put that out there. Maybe this becomes a pilot that we can come back and look at, or we look at what the experiences are. I'm not, I'm supportive of the bill, and I, I trust all of you, and supportive of your objective. And I do want to favor convenience and choice, but I don't want to do so at some point that down the road uh, we find that uh, rights um, are lost because we we pursued this. Ms. Ruth, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, I agree with you, Mr. Cedillo, and I can tell you we are vigilant. I'm the supervising attorney, although I work for Los Angeles Dependency Lawyers, the unit that I am in. I'm the supervising attorney of the law office of Emma Castro. Um, I think uh, those of you from Los Angeles know the commitment Emma Castro has had to representing parents and children in the dependency systems. And we are vigilant and zealous in our representation of our clients, and there will be no slippery slide. Ms. Firth, I think since this has been raised by two of our committee members, uh, Senator Liu, you might want to consider an amendment for the next committee. I know that this is doubly referred to judiciary, so it's going to have a second policy committee hearing that the amendment would state that no parent inmate would have, have their right to attend in person these court hearings uh, be abrogated. Oh, sure. Yes. It's not a problem. Yes, Senator Wright. What would also be provided would be um, the ability to actually teleconference into some hearings that were not mandated. So you would actually have the ability to have more participation than you currently have because some of the hearings are not mandated. So there could be an expansion of participation, but we're, but we're not taking away the right of the parent who wishes to go. So, okay, I, I, Fine. I That's exactly it. I take that as a motion That's to a, move I, this to I, judiciary. I moved, I moved the bill, Mr. Very Chair. good. Thank you. We have a motion by Senator Wright. And if you'd like to close, Senator Liu. I just simply ask for your support on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. We will call the roll. Leno. Aye. Leno, aye. Cogdill. Cedillo. Aye. Cedillo, aye. aye. Hancock. Huff. Aye. Huff, aye. Steinberg. Wright. Aye. Wright, aye. Thank you. And we have four votes. Your bill is out. We'll keep the roll open so other members can. Thank you very much. On. Thank you, members. Thank you, Senator Liu. <laughs> Assemblyman Solario, welcome to our committee. Committee members, we are on our item number six, <coughs> the Assemblyman's AB 552. On your favorite subject of AB 900. Our favorite subject. <laughs> our favorite subject. Our favorite subject. Work continues. That's right. Welcome back. <laughs> Chairman and members, I'm pleased to announce that CDCR and the prison court receiver have come to a resolution on a plan regarding the appropriate number of medical and mental health beds needed in our state's adult prison system. Uh, this bill, AB 552, is an urgency bill that will help implement that resolution. While the provisions in the bill are largely technical, they're very important in enabling CDCR to use some of the AB 900 bond funding previously authorized for building new infill beds to also be used for beds and treatment spaces serving inmates with acute medical and mental health needs. Passage of this legislation would allow CDCR to renovate an existing facility in Stockton to offer 1,743 medical and mental health beds. The build out of this facility is, of this facility is expected to cost $2.4 billion, $5.6 billion less than was the receiver's initial uh, plan and request for medical and mental health beds. Not only will this new capacity ensure compliance with uh, existing court concerns, 
but it will also free up existing space at existing prison facilities that are currently servicing uh, those inmates. Um, this bill is not intended to weaken other rehabilitation provisions in AB 900. We know there have been concerns raised by SCIU on that uh, regard, uh, and today to help address uh, that concern, I'm accepting committee amendments to tighten the language and ensure that the rehabilitative programming services remain intact as consistent with the intent of AB 900. I do have also with me today Dean Borg, Director of Administration for Facilities, and Darby Kernan with CDCR to speak and answer any questions you may have. I ask for your eye vote. Thank you, Assemblyman Solario. Uh, committee members, you should have the author's amendments before you, which would be placed onto page three, beginning at line 32, and page six, beginning at line 32 as well. And so welcome to your witnesses. Hi, I'm Darby Kernan. I'm the uh, new Assistant Secretary of Legislation for the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, also known as the new jo Joyce Hey Ho. <laughs> um, um, we are, CDCR is sponsoring this bill, and the primary reason is because the Attorney General's Office had said we needed these technical changes to get a clean bond opinion. Um, we um, appreciate your staff's work on these amendments. We think that they do um, address the concerns of SEIU and help tighten up the language and that we unintentionally um, had done. So, and programming is a big part of what we are doing and we're hoping that by moving these uh, inmates into the appropriate spaces that we get to free up the classrooms and the gyms and get them to be able, the mainstream inmates be able to program. So thank, thank you, you. and Dean Borg um, with our department can give you more of the details. Welcome, Mr. Borg. Uh, good, good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Dean Borg with the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Uh, just a few little it's, uh, things background regarding the project and lease revenue funding. In order to commence the design on a uh, project to be funded from the AB 900 lease revenue bonds, the State Public Works Board and the Pooled Money Investment Board from the Treasurer's Office depends upon the assurances of the Attorney General's Office that they can provide a clean bond opinion when it comes time to sell the bonds uh, at some point later on in the project. When the Attorney General's Office reviewed the project proposal for the uh, California health care facility, the 1,700-bed facility proposed in Stockton for medical and mental health inmates. Uh, last December, they uh, provided, they informed the department that it wouldn't meet the criteria that currently exists in AB 900 as far as the scope of the project was concerned, and thus they would be unable to provide a clean bond opinion. The language that was amended in AB 552 last week uh, had been reviewed by the Attorney General's Office. They clarified that that would meet their needs. We have preliminary information from them that says the committee amendments will also continue to do that so we appreciate the ability to work on that and uh, we we believe that this will help address the Attorney General's concern about clean bond opinion uh, just a few other things to address the concerns that have been raised. I want to emphasize that this bill will not provide CDCR with the authority to unilaterally determine what amount of programming space is appropriate in these facilities, uh, the facilities built with AB 900 funding. Language of the government code requires CDCR to provide a project proposal to the, uh, to the Joint Legislative Budget Committee at least 30 days before the Public Works Board would take action to uh, approve a project and begin the funding of the project. Uh, I brought with me two examples of the uh, proposals currently being reviewed by the Joint Legislative Budget Committee. Uh, one of them is the 1,700-bed facility in Stockton. Details of these documents uh, provide our uh, commitment to provide rehabilitation space in these facilities and the programs that we intend to uh, provide in those in those facilities. They're currently, as I said, currently being reviewed by legislative staff, and we'd have a number of meetings uh, regarding them. So to close, the passage of AB 552 would not be the final word on how much space is dedicated for rehabilitative programmings uh, in the AB 900 construction projects. Uh, it will allow us to move forward with the projects, ensure us that we can have a clean bond opinion, but the uh, final guarantee that we uh, live up to the rehabilitation space in these projects rests with the uh, JLBC review of these proposals as, as each one comes forward. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Borg. And the original Joyce Hayhoe, welcome. <laughs> Joyce Hayhoe, legislative consultant representing federal receiver Clark Kelso for our prison health care system. Um, this is a very monumental uh, bill that we're looking at today. Last year, the receiver, Mr. Kelso, worked very closely with Matt Kate and the administration based on the fact that the California is in such a severe budget crisis. What we were able to do was to come up with a very comprehensive 
integrated bed plan that uh, represents bed needs for both corrections, bed needs for our mental health inmates and bed needs for our medical inmates. Based on the integrated health plan that we have put together, this will uh, serve as the basis for taking care of all of the beds that we need, both for medical and mental health space as well as treatment space, and we will no longer need to come back to the legislature to ask for additional money to take care of our physical space needs. Thank you, Ms. Aho. And do we have anyone else here in support? And then we'll move on to opposition. I just want to uh, confirm, Mr. Borg, before we go to opposition, uh, I remember in my support of AB 900 and also part of the negotiations that crafted the compromise that led us to the bill, that before the phase two proceeds, that we there are thresholds to confirm mm -hmm. the inmate assessments and programming would be in place. Yes. Right, so every every new inmate has the assessment of vocational and educational, psychological, all of those needs are assessed, which right. was one of the reasons that led me to support it, and that also this is not about prison expansion, that none of these beds uh, would be used other than for those who are current to relieve our overcrowding so that we can clear space in our system so that there is room for the programs to engage in the rehabilitation, which we intend will lower our recidivism rate. Yes, sir. That uh, The primary purpose of these projects exactly is pull inmates out of existing spaces, in many cases that are not appropriate for them for their right. mental health or medical spaces, and uh, be able to bring inmates from non-traditional beds in, into those locations. Very good. Thank you. So those in opposition or in question? Helen Roth Dowden with SEIU Local 1000. And we really appreciate the work of your staff for uh, coming up with amendments. As you know, this bill came into, we just saw it March 15th. A week later, we're now having a hearing on it, so it's been a bit of a tight schedule. But thank you very much for having your staff work on this. You certainly allayed a lot of our concerns with these amendments. We and still. Yes. <laughs> So um, maybe it's when you sort of get to having to make a decision that everybody, you know, gets your attention. But it is a monumental bill. And we did have some concern in that you're both amending the first and the second part of it, the phase two, where we really feel there's some questions about whether a lot of things have been actually accomplished in CDCR that they said they were going to do under the original AB 900. And I think maybe John Kern, who's with me, can get into that a little bit. I would say that we still have a little bit of concern about a definition of a mental health bed and a definition of a medical bed. It wasn't that clear really in AB 900 to begin with. Um, we understand from talking to Dean Borg, and we appreciate his talking to us last night about you know some of the other uh, technical uh, fixes that were made. And we have a call in to the Attorney General to figure out exactly what is needed for the bonds. We wanted to talk to them ourselves. They were in a meeting this morning and said they would get back to us. So we want to continue working on this. We're hoping that we can reach an agreement, that we can remove our opposition. But we thought, since this is probably going to be the only hearing that there's in, on this bill on the side that we really needed to, to voice some of our concerns here. Thank you, Mr. Dowden. Welcome, Mr. Kern. Uh, hi, I'm John Kern. I'm with SEIU 1000 and also um, a 25-year department employee formerly engaged in uh, teaching vocational horticulture on the adult side. Um, about a year ago, I was in front of your public safety committee uh, talking about life in the trenches. Well, those trenches have been largely emptied of uh, fighters. And uh, so even though a technical or even larger fix to this bill would hardly uh, do anything to allay that situation, uh, I feel like I'm just here to remind you in this town that um, lack of programming space is no longer a problem. There is all kinds of programming space sitting empty, programming equipment sitting idle inmates idle in other parts of the prison not occupying that programming space. So the illusion to some extent that's been created up here by AB 900 and the many fixes that have been necessary in that bill um, is that somehow building the space will make the program happen. So that triggered our great concern uh, when we saw that the <coughs> department was 
attempting to redefine the, uh, the you know, the, the level of rehabilitation that needed to be tied to new beds. Obviously, it's the old beds that exist now that lack the rehabilitation programs, in our opinion. Uh, these programs have been just recently, within the last two weeks, uh, completely, um, you know, emptied out. Uh, vocational programs have gone from 300 statewide, which is grossly inadequate, to 170 or so statewide, which is, um, you know, on death's door. So um, that's really, uh, it's, it, for us, it's almost more an issue of uh, trust of the department and uh, concern uh, with the perhaps inadequate legislative oversight. We're um, 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 heartened by the fact that the Joint Legislative Budget Committee does have to look at uh, every CDCR proposal, and uh, hopefully that will be uh, uh, adequate. But um, again, the definition of mental health or medical beds, uh, from my point of view, in the trenches, in the field, is a, um, a, a form of uh, compartmentalization and categorization of inmates. It doesn't always match the reality. Most inmates have a broad complex of issues that the compass assessment or the, that the department is supposed to be uh, doing um, should help the department address, whether it's vocational, lack of vocational skills, mental health issues, regular med medical issues, family issues, substance abuse <coughs> issues, all the complex of issues that brings a person into our system, um, in most cases over and over, as you know. Um, need to be addressed, and by uh, sequestering inmates into beds defined as mental health or medical and pretending that the rest of the issues somehow don't apply, or by defining inmates as general population and pretending that mental health or other medical issues somehow uh, are, 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 are not part of their complex of difficulties. Um, is kind of a systemic problem, and, and uh, that's not directly addressing the, the provisions of this bill. I think Helen um, Dowden expressed it pretty well that we're, we're, we're concerned with um, some more of the technical details. We do appreciate the movement uh, on the amendments that have been uh, you know, suggested so far. Thank you, Mr. Kern. Yeah. Your issues and concerns are the same as mine. I think we all recognize that the threat to the budget for rehabilitation programs is a part of our fiscal crisis, uh, which is why I'm working with Ms. Hayso, Ms. Hayhoe and the receiver on a number of bills that would save us hundreds of millions of dollars in our health care costs, which I would like to see redirected toward rehabilitation because, again, we have yet to successfully attend to the sky-high rate of recidivism we have, which is directly related to our lack of rehabilitation programs. Um, it, yes, I, I would just say that it's to the point where even uh, the safety of staff inside the institutions is uh, at risk before public safety, um, which is ultimately all, all of our goals. We certainly support the building of the facility. We certainly support uh, getting the receiver out of the medical care business as fast as possible. We understand that, in the words of Senator Wyland the other day, every dollar spent on medical care by the receiver is a dollar we can't spend on vocational training. But I just have to close by saying that um, uh, rehabilitation programs, education programs in the prison took way more than their share of the recent cuts. It wasn't a cut directly attributable only to the fiscal crisis and budget crisis. There was a much deeper cutting at that time, partly uh, due to the vote of this body, but also uh, by choices that the department itself made. Um, one more point, and then I'll get off the soapbox. You did ask uh, Mr. Borg about whether the department had met the thresholds that helped you support AB 900 in the first place. Those were similar provisions that helped us support AB 900 in the first place, and we had great hopes for that uh, legislation. Uh, in my opinion, I could be corrected, the 10 percent increase in inmate participation in academic and vocational <coughs> programs that should have triggered phase two was accomplished not by increasing inmate participation in terms of inmate numbers. It was accomplished by cooking attendance books, in a sense, and showing an increase in attendance relative to non-attendance of the existing inmates in existing programs. And I found that very disappointing at the time. And of course, in our current situation now, we have 
a precipitous decline of inmate participation in both academic and vocational programs. So, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kern. Yeah. Mr. Warren. David Warren, Taxpayers for Improving Public Safety. <laughs> it's uh, with great disappointment that I have to oppose this legislation because we have long long been advocates for building medical facilities for inmates. However, to build a facility twice the size of Bellevue Hospital <clears throat> or al almost three times the size of L.A. County, which is the largest in the state of California, at one place in Stockton is a gross mistake. And before this legislation is approved, this committee should examine exactly what you're getting f for the money you're spending. The majority of commitments come from Southern California. Building a facility in Stockton is going to make it geographically impossible for many of the inmates' families to visit them. Unfortunately, Stockton is not a regional airport. If you want to fly there, you fly through Las Vegas. Mr. Warren, I appreciate your concern, but that's not what's okay. in this bill. Okay. So if you could keep your comments okay. to this bill. Uh, <clears throat> Second, um, the uh, AB 900 standards are not being met. The most recent CROB report dated March 15th clearly indicates that regretfully the compass assessments were not being done and are supposed to be started next month, but that's in doubt. The educational standards are clearly not being met. Rehabilitation programs are clearly not being met. Before we spend more money, we should make sure what we're, what we're getting what we were promised and we are not. Thank you. Could the department please respond? Um, yes, we are. Um, we have been using our compass um, assessment, but we are now using it to a more efficiently, um, both prior to an inmate coming into the system and prior to them leaving to make sure that the services they need before they leave, they are assessed for. Um, uh, with regards to the education, we are releasing our new education models, which will um, increase the number of teachers that we will be having instead of teaching assistants, addressing SEIU's concerns that they raised in the sub-4 budget um, process. So we will be implementing that, but we had to move forward with our layoff notices that, um, prior to making those changes, and we will be rehiring, I believe it's up to 65 new teachers to address um, their concerns and to, without impacting our savings. Okay. Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, Mr. Senator Cedillo. Um, I know it's not um, part of the bill, but c could you address this question of siting of the, of the facility? The size of the facility, siting, oh, and size. Um, I think Dean might be better suited for that one. Mr. Borg, welcome back. Thank you. There we go. Uh, a lot of the work on the facility uh, was begun uh, through the office of the receiver, and then uh, recently has been coordinated uh, with with the department. And I think a lot that had to do with that was the ability to site the facility w where there's existing land. Um, so the department, the uh, receiver's office, and the department jointly has looked at the uh, portfolio <laughs> of uh, youth authority and adult facilities, finding where there might be available land, and then tying that with other things such as uh, ability to hub it uh, near prisons. Uh, obviously going from uh, the Stockton area through Sacramento out through Vacaville and including San Quentin there's a number of northern facilities that can hub there uh, and it's a community that can support the level of services that are, are necessary in order to um, staff a, a place of that location if we you know were to go to the geographic center of the state and find a you know a location somewhere in the Central Valley the ability to bring in the staff that would be necessary uh, at, the, at the, the the professional staff necessary to house it would be would be difficult and uh, I think the you know, I, I just wanted to add that we had an existing youth facility. You know, we're using that same property to build a facility there. Uh, there's still going to be medical beds throughout the system. So, you know, if individuals, you know, get sick, you know, individuals, family members will still have the opportunity to visit those inmates. Here what we're talking about is a facility for those that have very acute medical and mental health needs, but there'll still be medical beds throughout the city. If there are conditions that, let's say in Southern California, someone needs to go to a hospital, receive a certain type of acute service, uh, they'll still be able to do that in, you know, in, in other parts of the region. So this isn't going to be the only place where we send, uh, you know, sick folks to. This is just for the most acute that have, you know, a longer term need. And Senator, I think some of your concerns will also be addressed by the Joint Legislative Budget Committee, which mm -hmm. will give this a very close read. Any other opposition? Senator Wright, you had a question, comment. Um, I wanted to see if I understand the, the concern I heard raised by the opposition 
and I, I don't want to characterize it incorrectly, so I want to be clear. It, it didn't speak necessarily to what was in the bill, but it spoke to how the bill impacted the educational component. Am I, am, am I correct there, sir? I'm, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so if that's inaccurate, but as I'm looking here, your concern is that the educational programs are adversely impacted by the, the way the health is being done. Senator Wright, I don't that, know that we want to start a dialogue here, but if you have a question of Mr. Kern, I'm happy to let you ask okay. it. That's a, if we could make room choices, for right? Mr. Kern right here. Okay. He's, I'm, I'm just trying to understand the nature of, of his opposition to the bill. We have some technical op uh, opposition, and we have some questions about whether the thresholds, the goals of AB 900 are being met unevenly. We understand this bill is a technical fix to uh, theoretically allow bond money to be released and progress to be made. We don't want to take a position that interferes with that appropriate progress. But I am here to remind sort of the body at large that the educational and rehabilitative goals also outlined in AB 900 have been uh, not met. And in fact, we've been going backwards. And despite the claims of the department, we still uh, beg to disagree on that. Okay. And Ms. Hayhoe, you have a response? Yeah, and, and maybe to help this along, uh, there is a requirement in the original AB 900 that any of the educational goals or any of the other um, benchmarks must be um, agreed to by a three-person panel, irrespective of the department, the state auditor, the office of the inspector general, and a representative from the judicial council. So those things that Mr. Kern are concerned about today would be looked independently to see that those benchmarks are met before phase two money can be allocated, and that isn't changed by anything that we're doing today in this bill. Very good. I hope so that answers one, your question. One other, right. that, that, that does. one other question is, if we're going to use telemedicine as a function in this process, it, it speaks to, I guess now, do we need a hospital of the size being proposed if we're going to be able to telecom, I guess this is a, an offshoot of the previous bill, but won't telemedicine eliminate some of the need for the size of facility that you're talking about? Actually, we are not creating new beds. These are beds that are going to be needed for the entire inmate population of 167,000 offenders. Actually, telemedicine will probably be most utilized in this facility as we take inmates from different parts of the state and be able to have a telemedicine center of excellence here in Stockton where we can branch out and and use um, inmates uh, there with their doctors uh, throughout the state and also specialists that we can reach out throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wright. We're going to lose some members here, so unless there are any other questions from the committee members, we have a motion so moved. With, uh, as amended with the author's amendments. And if you would like to close. I asked for I know we're losing members fast. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So we will call the roll. Leno. Aye. Leno, aye. Cogdale. Sidio. Aye. Sidio, aye. Hancock. No. Hancock, no. Huff. Steinberg. Wright. Aye. Wright, aye. We'll put that bill on call. Thank you, Senator. And Appreciate take it up before we adjourn. Thank you, Assemblyman. Thank you. Senator Negrete McLeod is our next and last author to present. <laughs> Charm. And before you begin, I'm going to move the consent calendar, which is Senator Padilla's bill, SB 1447, and let's call the roll on that. Leno? Aye. Leno, aye. Cogdale? Cedillo? Aye. Cedillo, aye. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Huff? Steinberg, right, aye. right, aye. And we will put that on call. Welcome, Senator Negrete McLeod. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. What I'm going to bring before you today is an innovative thing 
that's, that's going to occur in my county. Uh, San Bernardino County has about 10,000 parolees, the second largest numbers of parolees in the state, but lacks corresponding resources to provide adequate services to this population. These parolees live in the largest geographical county in, in the country and are often required to travel great distances to reach the services they need and or are required to obtain as a condition of the parole while most relying on public transportation. SB 973 would establish a pilot program for parolee services in the city or county of San Bernardino. SB 973 was brought to me by a local organization known as CREST, Community Reentry Education Services and Training. CREST is a group of state, county, and local governments and area nonprofit organizations who are trying to increase public safety and lower recidivism rates by establishing a single location where parolees can receive comprehensive services. A fully implemented CREST program would increase public safety in San Bernardino County, establish a model that could be re replicated throughout the state, and ultimately save the state in long-term incarceration and reincarceration rates. By, break of re by breaking the cycle of recidivism. And today I have the innovators of CREST with me today, and they will answer any questions you have. We can take testimony after that. Welcome. <laughs> Former Secretary, welcome back to our Morning, committee. Mr. Chair and committee members, uh, I haven't seen anyone in this type of body in <laughs> over three years. I am here as a former Secretary of Corrections, a former warden, and as a member of Mayor Morris's ad hoc committee on reentry in San Bernardino that started over four years ago. As the, uh, the good senator said, CREST is kind of unique from my perspective in that as we went forward in the reorganization of California Corrections, one of the things we created in that reorganization was the division of community partnerships. And that was done based upon research that reflected that if you really wanted to make a significant change in recidivism rates, you had to have a presence in the community and you had to have a mechanism in order for the community services that are provided at the local level tie back into the assessments and the capability of the Department of Corrections to provide in-custody services in the prisons. I went to work with Mayor Morris, and as a result of that work, we've created what I consider to be probably a model uh, of comprehensive ability to provide services at a local level with an additional political law enforcement and judicial support within that community where everyone is on the same page and understands what the needs are and understands what their role might be in doing that. CREST is a program that pulls together the university, the Department of Education, the Mayor's Office, the Police Department, the Sheriff's Department, the local probation department, the public defender, DA and all of the service providers that are community-based organizations in that area under one auspices of one organization under one roof to provide services for the number of people that come back to San Bernardino that are on parole. So I think it's a program that focuses not only on the parolee but over on the family. And that intergenerational criminality that goes around and around and around is much larger than just the individual that's incarcerated. It has many, many tangential effects and many, many tangential issues in it that are addressed under this program. So I think that it's a program that should be really given serious consideration for pi uh, piloting, and I support it from both a uh, uh, professional perspective and from a provider perspective. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for sharing your experience and your expertise. Yes. Good morning. Oh, I'm Carolyn Eggleston with the Center for the Study of Correctional Education at Cal State University in San Bernardino. And I want to preface my remarks not because it's particularly interesting, but because it'll frame what I'm going to say. Uh, I actually spent almost 20 years working as a teacher and a school principal in prisons. And so I'm really speaking from both a practitioner as well as research orientation. One of the exciting things about this CREST project is it really does combine practice and theory. We have really looked at the research with the three-judge panel, you know, years of research on recidivism, as well as our knowledge uh, from having worked inside to try to develop something that addresses more than one-size-fits-all for parolee reentry. We have a tradition of uh, having one uh, effort for parolees, if they get anything at all, it's sort of directed toward the general. And we know that there are complex problems. It's not just one kind of problem for each person. So we're looking at an individualized approach, a family approach, which will include um, working with families to break the cycle that Rod was talking about, and importantly, 
trying to uh, address individual needs in a setting that doesn't require people to go all over the place when transportation is a terrible uh, problem in our area. So those are uh, some of the factors. It's got a strong ac accountability uh, factor. It's got uh, research orientation so that we can start looking at outcomes because this is one of the problems we've had traditionally with parolee reentry is we haven't been identifying what the um, outcomes might be so we can see if it can even be replicated. Another really important dimension of the CREST project is capacity building for the community because as we have a pilot project, it's really a great idea, but then when pilots go away, the community goes right back to the way it was before. So one of the uh, earmarks of this, uh, probably not the rest word to use, one of the um, items that are associated, <laughs> one of the items associated with this is that we are going to try to do capacity building for the nonprofit organizations so that when a pilot is finished, they are able to then um, increase their service, increase the, their abilities to uh, continue in the community because they don't often have any method of doing outcomes, they don't often have accountability measures, and so they don't really know how to continue on. That's a, that's a big portion of it. I've been doing this work for quite a number of years. I'd rather not say how many years, but a lot of years. And one of the things that really is unique about this program is it truly is something that's come from the community. I've never seen a, a groundswell from the community like this one, where folks have been working for almost five years on trying to get a program that will really meet the needs of a community that's in crisis. I don't think I'm stating that too strongly. This is a community in crisis. And these folks have come together with the will of trying to improve where they live. And the organizations have come together in a way that is not common. Um, we'd like the opportunity to see if we can develop an innovative uh, effort that could be replicated in other areas in the state. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Eggleston, for your testimony today. Anybody else in support of Senator Negretti McLeod's SB 973? Anyone here to speak in opposition? Committee members? I the bill, Mr. Chair. Okay, we have a motion by Senator Wright. I think that you're on the right track here, of course. We have a lot yet to do with regard to reentry and preparation for successful reentry uh, re into our communities. And I think that given the size and the geography of your county that, and the high number of offenders who return to San Bernardino, that this can be of special benefit and significance. So you may have another debate in appropriations. That's not for us here today. So I'm very happy to support your bill. You know, we we get all kinds of ideas for bills. We get all kinds of things that we personally think. But when they came to me, I thought, oh, my God, what a wonderful idea. Not only does it take care of, of, of the number of, of, of parolees that come back to where they came from originally, but an ability to replicate this program uh, for someplace else that that it would act as as a outstanding model and 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 it would do what we say that we are going to do when we send prisoners to prison. That not only are they going to be incarcerated and serve out their term, but they're going to be rehabilitated to come back into a community and be productive citizens. So this is a wonderful model. And I know that this has been modeled on the success of the East Palo Alto parole reentry program. <coughs> our analysis points out that whereas our recidivism rate statewide is in the neighborhood of 66, 67 percent, twice the national average, that over 100 participants in the East Palo Alto program, the recidivism rate dropped to 48 percent. So I think there is proof in this pudding. So I wish you well with it, and if you'd like to close, or I'll take your last comment as you close. I your right. Very I good. vote. We will call the roll. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question? Of course. Senator. Thank you very much. I apologize for missing most of the debate, but I just had a question as it relates to SB uh, X318 that the legislature passed last year that, in our opinion, dismantled a lot of similar programs to this. I'm just wondering what the, if any, um, correlation there is between the two, or do you see any kind of an inconsistency? 
Uh, it's not understanding that there will be any inconsistency. It, it does change slightly the potential for who might be um, enrolled in these kinds of programs, but I don't think there's a, a, a conflict in any way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. If no further questions from the committee, we will call the roll. Leno? Aye. Leno, aye. Cogdale? Aye. Cogdale, aye. Cidio? Aye. Cidio, aye. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Huff? Aye. Huff, aye. Steinberg, right? Aye. Right, aye. You have unanimous support, seven votes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. I like this committee okay. so much I came back three times. Please come. <laughs> You're always welcome. And we will lift calls, committee members, so we can conclude our business. We're going to start, well, we'll go in uh, chronological order. We'll start with number one, item one, Senator Runner's SB 839. And we will lift the call, call the absent members. Uh, Senate Bill 839. Uh, Cogdale? Aye. Cogdale, aye. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Huff? Aye. Huff, aye. Steinberg? Bill has six votes, and it is out. Item number two, Senator Yee's SB 840. Call the roll, please. Cogdill? Aye. Cogdill, aye. Huff? Item two, Senator Yee, uh, SB 840. Aye. Huff, aye. Steinberg, right? Aye. Right, aye. That bill is out six to zero. Item number three, Senator Liu's SB 962. Call the roll, please. I'm sorry, I got that. Okay. Cogdale? Aye. Cogdale, aye. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Steinberg? That bill is out six to zero. Item number four, we've just heard, and that is out six to zero. Item number five is our consent calendar. Call the roll on it. Cogdale? Aye. Cogdale, aye. Huff? Aye. Huff, aye. Steinberg? That bill is out six to zero. And then our last bill would be item number six, Assemblyman Solorio's AB 552. Please call the roll. As amended. As amended. As amended. Cogdale? H Huff? Steinberg. We will put that bill Mr. back Chairman, on call. Yes. Um, I will change my vote from no to I. Okay. I'm having looked at the amendments in the context of the bill. I, I would like the record to show that I. Why don't you put I'm, your mic on for that? Thank you. There you go. That I am extremely concerned about the lack of coordination of services with beds and educational services, particularly. And um, I hope that we're going to see. Um, AB 900 uh, monies put toward the rehabilitative services that will keep people out of the revolving door. Thank you, Senator Hancock, not only for your comments, but your, for your vote, and then also just uh, for reassurance, because they also reassure me that before the monies are spent, it will the entire project in phase will go before the uh, Joint Legislative Budget Committee. And then there are also, as Ms. Hayhoe pointed out, a three-member panel which will be overseeing the projects as well and making sure it's in compliance with the original AB 900. Okay, so change, so, so uh, with that vote change, uh, okay. Okay, Hancock, aye. Mm -hmm. That bill then is out four to zero. With no further business before us, thank you, committee members. We are adjourned.